Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this Guidelines International Network North America webinar on USPSTF methods for making recommendations for diverse populations. I'm Tracy Walsh. I'm serving as the moderator for this session. Um, I also serve on the steering group for the Guideline International Network North America steering group, and I will be your, um, your moderator today, which I've just said. Um, GIN North America is a network for guideline users, developers, and other stakeholders to form partnerships and discuss regional guideline issues. For more information on GIN and GIN North America and how to join, please go to www.g-i-n.net and click on North America under the Communities tab. Just some logistics for this uh, webinar. Please keep your phone on mute. Uh, please don't put us on hold or we'll hear some music for some of you. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. And we'll hold questions, most questions until the end unless they're clarifying questions. To ask questions, if you look at the top right corner of the screen, you'll see a, a chat and a chat box. If you click on that, a window will open so that you can type in your questions. We have, um, we have many, many people um, on this call, so unfortunately we cannot take questions by phone. Going to do some introductions and then get started. As I said, I'm Tracy Wolf. I'm the Associate Scientific Director of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force Program at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ. AHRQ is the agency that supports the task force with technical assistance. I'm board certified in family medicine and preventive medicine and have worked with the task force program for over 12 years. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Kirsten Bivens Domingo, our first presenter. Dr. Bivens Domingo is the Lee Goldman Endowed Chair in Medicine and Professor of Medicine of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco. She is a general internist and attending physician at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital engaged in outpatient clinical activities. She's the director of the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. She's also the director of the UCSF Clinical and Translational Science Institute's training program. She's currently the principal investigator of a Center of Excellence in Minority Health and Health Disparities funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. Bivens Domingo is the immediate past chair of the USPSTF and served as a member starting in July 2010 and was previously appointed vice chair in March 2014. I'm also pleased to introduce our other two presenters. Dr. Jennifer Lin is a board-certified practicing general internist and primary care with Kaiser Permanente and the director of the Kaiser Permanente Research Affiliate, EPC, or Evidence-Based Practice Center. Dr. Lin's career interests have focused mainly on evidence-based medicine and healthcare policy, as well as primary and preventive care. She serves as the principal investigator for the USPSCF contract to conduct systematic reviews to support the task force recommendation process. Dr. Lynn also serves on the American College of Physicians Clinical Guidelines Committee and Kaiser Permanente National Guidelines Director. Dr. Michelle Eder is the co-director of the Scientific Resource Center to support the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and leads activities to assist the USPSCF in prioritizing topics and conducting topic development. She has also been involved with the systematic reviews conducted by the Kaiser Permanente Research Affiliate, Affiliate EPC for the task force, for the Community Preventive Services Task Force, and for the American Psychological Association. So this is our agenda for the next approximately 90 minutes. Um, Dr. Bimens Domingo will talk briefly about the task force recommendations and the task force processes. processes. Dr. Lynn and Dr. Eaters will talk about uh, evidence considerations, and then Dr. Bimens Domingo will talk about USPSDF considerations of the evidence, and then we'll hold the questions to the end. We're going to start with a few poll questions just to get an idea of who is on the line and who's listening. So this is the first poll question. 
and I will let you know when you can start. So how familiar are you with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force? Please choose only one answer. I have used or referred to task force recommendations. Two, I have not used task force recommendations, but have some knowledge of them. And three, I have no knowledge of the task force or experience with their recommendations. Okay, the poll is open. Just waiting for everyone to, to answer. We'll show the results in just a second. See the results. Most attendees have used or referred to the task force recommendations, and fewer have um, no knowledge or not used task force recommendations. So it seems like many of you are very familiar with the task force recommendations and the processes. So we'll open up the next poll. the next poll question. I'll read it and then we'll open it up. What best describes your experience with evidence-based guidelines? And you may choose more than one answer for this question. Number one, I am involved in the conduct of systematic reviews. Two, I am involved in developing guidelines. Number three, I am involved in using or implementing guidelines. Four, I am a clinician and use systematic reviews and or guidelines. Number five, I am involved in teaching others about evidence-based practice. Six, none of the above. So we'll open the poll now. Just give everyone a minute to answer, then we'll share the results. If you haven't had a chance to answer, please enter your answer and then we'll close the poll and show the results. Take two seconds and we'll show the results. 
are having some problem in showing the results right now, but it seems like many of you are involved in developing guidelines and using uh, our clinicians and using systematic reviews and guidelines. Um, fewer of you are um, not, or fewer of you are involved in teaching others. I'm sorry, we are having some technical difficulties, so we can't show you the results. are a list of resources, some recent publications by the presenters on this topic. This webinar and the slides will be saved on the GIN website, and we'll, we'll show you that website at the end so that, that you don't have to jot these down right now, but, but they'll be on the slides that are saved. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Bivens Domingo to start us off talking about the task force. Great, thank you very much, Tracy. Um, uh, so I, I thought I'd give a brief introduction to the task force. I know most of you are familiar with the task force, but to get everyone up to speed and on the same page. So we are uh, an independent panel of volunteer non-federal experts. There are 16 members on the task force who all have um, expertise in one of the primary care specialties, um, as well as uh, in, um, uh, in evidence-based uh, medicine. The task force makes recommendations on clinical preventive services offered in the primary care setting. These could include screening tests, preventive medications, or counseling. And our recommendations apply to asymptomatic patients, patients without signs or symptoms of disease. Next slide. So the goal of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is to improve the health of all Americans. Um, to achieve this goal, um, it is uh, part of our mission to pay particular attention to how our recommendations can be most effectively applied to specific segments of the U.S. population with patterns of disease or who may have patterns in uh, the effectiveness of a preventive service that may differ from the general population. It's essential for us to achieve our overarching goal to pay particular attention to uh, its use across the diversity of the U.S. population. And the specific populations that we are interested in may be those that are identified by a demographic characteristic, such as age, race, ethnicity, or sex, or other factors uh, like, um, that relate to risk, like biology, behavior, or heredity. Next slide. The steps that the task force takes are important to understand because we consider uh, how our recommendations apply to the diversity um, of the population uh, across uh, these multiple steps. So we have an open nomination process for new topics, and then uh, we uh, review our topic portfolio to have, make sure we have a balanced portfolio. Once we assure that we have, um, that a topic is going to proceed at, uh, to recommendation, uh, we create a research plan to get, together with the Evidence-Based Practice Center. The research plan is posted uh, for public comment, um, and we uh, develop the research plan in consultation uh, with expert uh, reviewers uh, at, at the outset. The research plan then guides how the Evidence-Based Practice Center uh, develops the evidence report, um, how they uh, gather the evidence and how it fits into our analytic framework that we're going to use uh, to, to make this recommendation. We use the evidence report to then develop the recommendation um, that is posted first in a draft form and then is eventually, uh, based on the comments we receive, revised and then uh, published in a final form, and then we disseminate our recommendation. Next. At each stage of this entire process, we solicit feedback from content experts, from subspecialists, the recommendations the research plan, the evidence report, the draft recommendation, each of those uh, products are posted for public comment. Are posted for public comment, um, so we get input from uh, the public as well. And then there is a peer review uh, of the evidence report prior to public posting. Next. 
So the task force uses this grid to develop its grades. Uh, next, um, the, on the left-hand side, you'll see that um, we evaluate first the certainty um, uh, based on the, the evidence base that we have to make the recommendation. Uh, so the certainty of, based on the quality or quantity of the, the studies that are available, so high, moderate, or low certainty. Um, we use then the evidence to determine whether the magnitude of the net benefit, uh, considering both the benefits and the harms of a preventive service, um, and then understanding uh, in aggregate what the, the net benefit is. And so once we consider both the certainty and the magnitude of net benefit, that allows us to arrive at the grade um, that we assign uh, to a particular recommendation. And uh, this grid is really what guides our entire uh, process. Next. Next slide. So again, just to summarize, grades A, B, and C are all grades in favor of a particular uh, preventive practice. They differ by the level of certainty of the evidence and the magnitude of potential net benefit. A D grade is, means that there is evidence, and the evidence suggests that there is no net benefit uh, or that there is net harm and is a recommendation against a particular uh, preventive uh, service. And then the I recommendation means there's not enough evidence to make a recommendation. And importantly here um, is to note that we uh, do not, as a part of our processes, uh, substitute expert opinion or our own judgment um, when there isn't sufficient evidence. Um, and, in, and in fact, an important goal of the task force is to call more for more research if evidence is lacking. Next slide. So the tensions in this work when we try to consider um, our goals of applying our processes to uh, the diversity of the populations that are seen in clinical practice um, is to understand um, what type and how much evidence do we need to make a recommendation for a particular group. We convened a, um, a subgroup of our methods work group to really understand this, and it was pretty clear that this was one of the, the major uh, tensions as we can considered how we would make sure our processes explicitly address uh, uh, the heterogeneity that exists in the population. A second tension is how do we balance the important goal of calling for more research in understudied groups with the desire to make a specific recommendation for a particular group. And then finally, uh, these are complex issues. So how do we communicate this complexity in a way that is useful for patients and clinicians? And so I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over now to my colleagues in, at the Evidence-Based Practice Center so they can uh, describe how they uh, consider uh, these processes. Great. Thank you, Kirsten. So um, this is Jennifer Lynn, and I'm actually going to be speaking on behalf of uh, both Michelle Eder and myself. I'm going to take the next um, 15, 20 minutes or so to talk about some of the processes and tools that we have to consistently consider the evidence on these specific populations from really the EPC or systematic reviewer perspective. Um, before I speak to the evidence considerations, I want to clarify the use of two uh, related terms I'll use in this presentation. So um, I'll use the term subpopulation to refer to the actual groups uh, specific groups of individuals that have common uh, patient characteristics that's often the target of an intervention or a policy recommendation. And in contrast, I'll use the term subgroup to refer to the analysis of a subset of uh, meta-analysis. Next slide. Next. Um, and in discussing the evidence considerations, I'm going to try to illustrate some of the operational guidance we've developed using a recent example from the task force portfolio. So we've, we've chosen the task force recommendation on aspirin to prevent cardiovascular events. This recommendation also encompasses to prevent uh, colorectal cancer, but I'll abbreviate it shorthand with cardiovascular events. Um, and you may or may not be familiar with this recommendation, so I'll briefly just let you know that the task force made a B recommendation recommending initiating low-dose aspirin for 
the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in adults age 50 to 59 that have a 10% or greater 10-year risk of a CVD event. And they gave a C recommendation, that is to personalize uh, the decision to initiate low-dose aspirin use for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease for ages 60 to 69, again, with a 10 or greater 10-year risk of um, cardiovascular disease. And at the time, they found insufficient evidence and issued an I statement for adults younger than 50 years and those adults older than 70 years. Next slide, please. So in an effort to achieve consistency and, com and transparency in communicating why and how the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force incorporates recommendations for various subpopulations based on risk, we articulated a conceptual approach that was developed with the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force and hopefully that both the task force and others can use to develop targeted recommendations in subpopulations. Here I've articulated six steps that the task force and the EPC address um, in, the, in formulating targeted recommendations. From the development of the research or work plan, that's our work protocol, to the conduct of the systematic review, uh, all the way to the deliberation of the evidence that's done by the task force and the formulation of the recommendation. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on steps one through three. So that is identifying the relevant populations at the work plan phase, and then identifying and evaluating the evidence at the systematic review phase. And at each step, I'll talk to you about the considerations at each of these steps, then some operational guidance on how we address these considerations, and then again, show you a work through example using the aspirin recommendation. And for folks who are interested um, for more detail, um, you can refer to the full publication when it's available, and the citation is below. Next slide, please. So first, the potential need for a targeted recommendation should be addressed early. That is, defining the populations of interest for the review and the recommendation need to happen at the protocol development stage. So as part of the work plan or research plan, we ask the question, are there clinically relevant subpopulations? So to answer this question, there are several questions that are built into this larger question. We need to know, are there clinically relevant differences in the distribution of disease or risk factor burden? So for aspirin, um, are there differences in the distribution of cardiovascular disease and its risk factors like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, family history, et cetera? Are there certain risk-based subpopulations that would benefit substantially more or less does the absolute risk vary by certain subpopulations? Those sorts of questions. Um, second, can the different subpopulations be clinically identified? Are the risk factors easily identified? So in this, we have to consider how good is clinical risk prediction based on single risk factors or are multiple risk factors preferable? Are there biomarkers or combinations of biomarkers clinically available that may aid in clinical prediction? Are there externally validated risk tools, multivariate risk tools that identify subpopulations that increased or reduced um, risk of benefit or harm? And are these tools better than using individual risk factors alone? And then sometimes we have to also think about, is the preventative service delivered differently um, for the different subpopulations? Which may make a decision on whether to include them or how best to address the evidence. One example is in older adults, is the preventative service sub to prevent falls in older adults different for institutionalized older adults? Uh, would that be delivered, you know, in the care homes versus in primary care? And so a decision needs to be made whether to include the population or not, and if the population is included, how best to address that evidence. Next slide. So we use a combination of targeted literature searches, key informant interviews, and a summary table to identify and communicate our choice of the most relevant um, subpopulations of interest. 
the targeted literature searches are really just that. We are looking at um, uh, evidence in existing clinical practice guidelines of how they consider different subpopulations, um, looking at recent systematic reviews and how they handle the data analysis on certain subpopulations, and then looking at the epidemiologic data uh, for specific um, subpopulations on incidence and prevalence of disease, morbidity and mortality of disease. We then do key informant interviews with just a handful of key informants, say two to four clinical or content experts in the topic area, and we're interested in getting their uh, identification of which subpopulations they would be most interested and their rationale of why. Uh, and then we put together a summary table to support and communicate the a priori selection of a limited number of patient subpopulations that we'll examine in, examine in the systematic review. Next slide. For example, so here's an example of sample questions or key informant interviews from the aspirin topic. Um, and in uh, the uh, uh, resource or the publication by Yvonne Whitlock and colleagues that we provide a template of these sorts of sample questions that are a little bit more generic. But during the development for the work protocol uh, for the aspirin review, we asked key informants about their knowledge about important advances in clinical research and clinical care that would influence how we looked at subpopulations, key pieces of evidence in various subpopulations, the differential treatment effects of benefits and harms by the different subpopulations, and ultimately their opinion on which subpopulation may warrant different recommendations. Next slide, please. Here is an ex uh, next slide, Tracy. Great. Um, here's an excerpt from, uh, from the summary table, which presents the findings from the targeted background literature searches and the key informant interview. So this excerpt focuses on the stratification of uh, by a sex, so male or female, as one of the a priori subpopulations addressed for this review. And the table summarizes how the previous review and recommendation address this subpopulation. So as you may already know, the task force is often faced with updating its own reviews and recommendations. So we include in this table how they've dealt with the, the subpopulation prior, if they did. The rationale for addressing this subpopulation, so relevant policy context that it could include how other systematic reviews or guidelines address this uh, these subpopulations, and including in this, you know, noting if there is any sort of disagreement or discordance in the systematic review and guideline findings. And ultimately, in the last column, how we propose handling this subpopulation. So if we're going to go forward uh, with this as an a priori defined subpopulation of interest for the review. Next slide, please. So now, during the conduct of the systematic review, so that was all in the work plan phase. So during the conduct of the systematic review to support clinical practice guidelines, and in this case specifically for the task force, the EPC or the reviewers should determine if there is evidence for the clinical question at hand in these a priori identified subpopulations. So that is, are there credible subgroup analyses for these subpopulations? To answer this question, we need to consider at the systematic review level what we just did in the work plan phase. Were the risk groups identified a priori or post hoc? And then again, at the individual study level, so those studies that we've included in the review, were these risk groups identified a priori or post hoc? How consistent is the definition of risk across the body of evidence? So for example, if we're looking at family history, how did they identify or how did they define family history? Is there a difference in how that um, risk group was conceptualized across the studies? And then how consistent was the reporting of results by risk group across the body of evidence? So if you included 20 studies and only two studies looked at these subpopulations, that's a little bit qualitatively different than if, you, if 18 of the 20 studies um, reported on that subgroup. Next slide, please. So we use an audit and credibility assessment process during the data abstraction and critical 
uh, appraisal phase of the systematic review to determine if there are if there is credible evidence for these specific subpopulations. The audit of the subgroups um, is essentially a working table that's identified during data abstraction so that we can determine if further investigation and full data abstraction of these subpopulations are warranted. I'll give an example in a moment. And then the credibility assessment of the subgroup analysis is incredibly important and is sort of bundled at the critical appraisal phase of each article. And for that, we're looking at not just the overall quality or risk of bias of the entire study, but in the subgroup analysis, the likelihood that the subgroup effects are spurious, the potential for confounding in a subgroup analysis, and whether the trial was in fact powered to detect subgroup differences if they did look at subgroups. And for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to defer to uh, Table 8 in the Whit Evelyn Whitlock's publication, um, which offers a lot more detailed questions about these three domains that can actually assist systematic reviewers in performing this credibility assessment. Next slide, please. Dr. Lynn, we have one question here, a clarifying question. Sure. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Are you reviewing only primary studies, or are you also reviewing systematic reviews and other guidelines in your work with the task force and these types of reviews? That's a great question. Um, predominantly, we're looking at individual studies, so we do go back to the individual studies. Uh, oftentimes, we identify systematic reviews and meta-analyses that we rely on, but even in those instances, I would say most often we still go back to the primary studies included in those reviews. There are a minority, and the exception of examples, we'll, we'll use a systematic review whole cloth. But a lot of what I'm talking about in principles, the operational guidance was really developed looking at individual studies, although probably with some adaptation they could be applied to the systematic review or meta-analysis level. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, maybe next slide. So in this example, so this is the sample audit table, just to give you a flavor of what this audit might look like. So in this example, um, again, from the aspirin uh, recommendation, we looked at subgroup analyses. One of the a priori subgroup analyses was by age group or age strata for the benefits and harms of aspirin. So if there were studies that only examined a specific age strata, that would be listed in uh, column two or the second column. Uh, the third column lists all the studies that reported subgroup analyses of interest, so on age. Um, the fourth column lists the outcomes of both the benefits and the harms. So the different uh, outcomes of benefits would include individual events, composite outcomes, and the different studies that uh, included subgroup analyses for that outcome. And you'll see notably that for harms, GI bleeding events from aspirin, there was actually only one, one trial that did a stratified analyses um, for, uh, for age. And then the last column summarizes the decision on uh, whether to move forward on a full abstraction. So in this case, age was an a priori defined subgroup. There were many studies, a majority of studies that reviewed and reported age-related subgroup analyses. And so we went on for full abstraction um, within these. For, for these included studies. Now, an audit table may not be necessary if you're dealing with a very small body of literature. In, in other words, it wouldn't be a time saver, or if there are very few subpopulations of interest. But it can be extremely helpful when you're dealing with larger bodies of, in, of, of evidence and um, lots of subgroup analyses, as the data abstraction, as many reviewers know, can be the most, one of the most time-consuming aspects of the systematic review process. Next slide. So after one's established um, that there is credible evidence in various subpopulations of interest, we need to know or we need to answer, do these subgroup analyses show clinically important differences? So that means that the individual 
do subgroup analyses suggest clinically meaningful differences um, between uh, the subpopulation and the general population or amongst the subpopulations defined? So before thinking about, in other words, before thinking about the net benefit at the individual level, are there meaningful differences in benefit? Are there meaning differences in harm? And there may be some judgment required here as the relative risk or absolute risk change, uh, there may not be, you know, there may be um, somewhat small differences and there may not be consensus on what is a meaningful, um, a meaningful change. And so these are issues that we, we face more often than not. It's also important to investigate if there are other potential sources of heterogeneity, both clinical and methodologic heterogeneity, that explain these differences that are, that are not due um, to the differences in populations. In other words, um, are the differences seen actually attributable to the, pop the differences in populations as opposed to something else? Next slide. So it's important at the data analysis and data synthesis phase to investigate those potential sources of heterogeneity, again, at the body of evidence level. Uh, attention to study design and study conduct details, attention to intervention details, control comparator group details, attention to the specific outcomes, all of these are very crucial in making fair comparisons with respect to, to drawing conclusions about population risk. The assessment of heterogeneity is not different than the, the process we use as reviewers to evaluate the heterogeneity of body of literature. And in, in Evelyn's paper, there we go through um, some more detailed consideration for folks who are interested. Um, and then we summarize the findings at, for each subpopulation at the subpopulation. Um, next slide. So this is uh, our last example. Uh, it's, a, again, an excerpt from the data table summarizing the findings of benefits for aspirin by age group. And here's just one study abstracted here, which is the women's health study. Um, in column two, we enter the subgroup analysis credibility rating. So that's the credibility rating that I referred to during step two. Um, in column three, we identify how the study uh, defined what the risk was. So in this case, it's age strata, but across the different studies, the age strata is evaluated might be slightly different. In column four, we abstract if there was a formal test for interaction conducted, and if there was, what was its statistical significance? And in the last column, We've abstracted um, both the relative and the absolute risk reduction by subpopulation. So in this example, you can see that there is a difference in um, the relative risk reduction for older women as compared to uh, younger women. Um, however, if you look at the absolute risk reduction, you could argue that that, uh, that, that absolute risk reduction uh, may not be clinically meaningful. And just to clarify, those p-values or the statistical significance that you're interested in is not, is really if there's a statistically significant difference in effect between the subgroups, not between the intervention group and the, um, the control group. So now I'm going to turn it back to Kirsten to talk about how the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force considers the net benefit um, of the evidence when weighing the evidence on various subpopulations. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. That was terrific. Um, so, um, so the task force is um, our, our regular procedure. Is the task force then takes the 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 evidence uh, review and synthesis uh, from the EPC and uses this to determine um, the the magnitude of of the net benefit and therefore the grade that one would assign. And so, when the when we were considering how we would um, further refine and develop our uh, procedures to address the heterogeneity that we know exists within the population, we, we felt strongly that we still had to be guided by um, those, those elements that determine our grade that have to do with certainty and, uh, and magnitude of net benefit. And so the examples that I'm going to work through um, really, uh, really 
um, address the issues of uh, subpopulations uh, in the context of uh, differences in magnitude of net benefit um, based on the evidence reports that then we receive from the evidence-based practice center. So um, next slide. So we're going to start off with something that's relatively easy. Um, so, um, so sometimes um, we have robust evidence um, that different segments of the pop across different segments of the population that allow us um, to uh, make a determination of corresponding differences in magnitude of net benefit. This is when we have um, the well-designed studies with the a priori hypotheses that allow us um, to make these types of determinations. And so the example we'll work through here is um, from mammography screening for breast cancer and uh, the age-specific uh, recommendations that the task force came to. Next slide. This is a, a meta-analysis of uh, the randomized control trials. In the case of breast cancer, we have multiple randomized control trials um, to examine it, to, that examine the effectiveness of, um, of mammography screening um, on the outcome of breast cancer mortality. In fact, we have trials that specifically look at this uh, younger age of the, the women in their 40s um, uh, um, undergoing mammography. And uh, the meta-analysis suggests that there are breast cancer uh, mortality reductions in each of the uh, age categories, the first three age categories, but the magnitude of this uh, difference varies by age. And so uh, the largest uh, risk reduction is in women in their 60s, and you can see the corresponding deaths averted, um, whereas the, the while women in their 40s uh, benefit, have a decrease in, um, in breast cancer mortality, the magnitude of that uh, benefit is um, smaller. Um, I won't, for interest of time, I'm not going to uh, review the harms. Uh, the harms in general are uh, false positives um, and, uh, and overdiagnosis. Um, these don't vary as much uh, by age, um, but, uh, but um, in the modeling studies that synthesize both the benefits and the harms, um, the, the lower degree of benefit plus the, the uh, constant likelihood of false positives means that on balance, um, the balance of benefits and harms in women in their 40s is different than those in their fifth, women in their 50s and 60s. And I'm going to come back to this in, uh, again, that women uh, ages 75 and older, there are no trials in these women, uh, but I'll come back to that again. So next slide. So as the task force then uh, uh, worked through its recommendation, uh, given that women in their 50s to 74 were the groups that were most likely, um, that had the largest uh, relative risk reduction based on the randomized control trials, and in the modeling studies that synthesized uh, the evidence from the trials, from uh, current practice patterns, um, it was clear that, uh, that based on the modeling studies that the magnitude of net benefit was the, the largest in these groups. The task force determined uh, that we had a moderate certainty of net benefit based on uh, multiple randomized control trials um, showing the efficacy of, uh, of mammography uh, for breast cancer screening, that the magnitude of net benefit was moderate and assigned a B recommendation uh, to uh, screening for women ages 50 to 74. Next slide. By contrast, um, because uh, the smaller uh, the smaller benefit in women in their 40s um, balanced against the, the harms that are present uh, in uh, women throughout the, the um, screening process led us to give, to assign a magnitude of net benefit as small and therefore issue a C recommendation with the language, the decision to start screening in women prior to age 50 should be an individual one. Women who place a higher value on the potential benefits than the potential harms may choose to begin biennial screening between the ages of 40 and 49. Next slide. So that is one where we have evidence, and we have evidence that allows for a determination of the, the heterogeneity. 
More often, as Jennifer alluded to, we are faced with a variability in the types of evidence or no evidence at all. And so let's work through, in the context of mammography, um, this, this example as well. So, so sometimes evidence uh, is suggestive that there's a difference in net benefit for a particular segment of the population, but the quality or volume of direct evidence is not sufficient for us to make a, a separate recommendation. For example, a, a specific population may be studied in RCTs, but the highest evidentiary standards that uh, Jennifer alluded to are, are lacking. Uh, so there's suggestion of difference, but, um, but we don't, they don't meet the highest standards. And here, the example that was relevant for mammography um, came in how we understood uh, the heterogeneity that exists amongst women in their 40s. Um, so we recognized that, that there was heterogeneity among women in their 40s and that we, in fact, had modeling studies that suggested that women who have a family history with a mother, sister, or daughter with breast cancer, those women in their 40s who have this family history have a risk of breast cancer that is similar to women in their 50s. So if we use risk as the, 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 uh, the defining, if we use um, risk as the defining factor uh, that uh, results in greater benefit for women in their 50s uh, compared to women in their 40s, um, this evidence suggesting that family history conveys risk for women in their 40s that's similar to those in their 50s might suggest that these women should actually um, have a, a, a different grade, a B grade. However, uh, because uh, the evidence did not come from, model, from randomized controlled trials, but in fact came from modeling studies, the task force felt if this was an important uh, uh, consideration and important uh, information to convey to patients and clinicians who are making this decision, but did not feel that we could make a separate B recommendation for women with a family history. And part of this rationale has to do um, with thinking through, uh, risk is one piece of this equation, but the question is whether um, biennial mammography screening in fact modifies that risk. And that's where um, the, the, the absence of evidence on this front uh, made it difficult for us to make a separate recommendation, um, specifically calling out a B in women who have a family history. Next slide. But we do want to convey information to, that is useful to patients and clinicians. And so this is how our recommendations look on our website. So as you can see, the B for women in their 50s to 74, the C recommendation, which has a lot of language um, that might factor into a woman's decision to be screened. And within this language in the C recommendation, next slide, Next slide, is a specific call out that says women with a parent, sibling, or child with breast cancer are at higher risk for breast cancer and thus may benefit more than average risk women for beginning screening in their 40s. So this is in the top line of our recommendation statement. It comes up first when you, when you look at and you read the recommendation sta statement in whatever form you're reading it. Um, uh, so calls out these high-risk women, but it's still a, a, within the, the overall C recommendation, suggesting that as women make an individualized decision, that this might be a factor that leads them to start screening in their 40s. Next slide. The final example, or the, the next example that we'll work through with mammography is that sometimes we have differences in disease ep epidemiology that might hint at a question of, um, of magnitude of net benefit um, based on just the epidemiology and patterns of disease that we see between populations. It's important to note here that differences in epidemiology alone don't usually allow for us to make a separate population-specific recommendation. Many of the factors that Jennifer um, discussed really have to be um, have to be considered when determining uh, what the nature of the the differences in the patterns of disease that are observed when one looks at the epi data um, in order to uh, determine whether we can in fact make a, a separate recommendation related to the preventive service. And so in this case, um, uh, what we considered uh, was um, African American women. Uh, we know that African American have women have higher rates of breast cancer mortality. But the challenge in, um, 
in making a separate recommendation for African American women is, is um, understanding whether screening um, would in fact uh, plays a role um, in uh, the higher rates of breast cancer mortality that are observed. Next slide. So, the, the, so when we considered uh, the impact of race on the effectiveness of mammography screening, here is the types of evidence that we, um, that we examined. And this came from, in fact, a similar process that the Evidence-Based Practice Center used for this recommendation uh, in order to make sure that we had the evidence in order to make uh, this type of determination. So African-American women are more likely to die of breast cancer than white women. Um, but the reason for this disparity in mortality outcomes is not entirely clear, and the lines of evidence suggest um, that biology may be an important contributor because women, African American women, are more likely to develop triple negative phenotypes and more aggressive tumors. There's also uh, clear that there are um, delays in receipt of healthcare services for cancer and even receipt of treatments altogether that may also contribute uh, to the differences in mortality among those diagnosed with breast cancer. African American women are underrepresented in the randomized controlled trials. These are performed largely in Europe and white women, and the direct evidence is lacking in this population, and so it was important important within our uh, framework uh, to call out the need for more research. Next slide. One of the most compelling pieces, though, as we try to consider whether screening um, um, uh, contributed to the or is likely to affect the mortality differences um, is, is the observation that in fact rates of screening and diagnosis of breast cancer are actually quite similar and that, that gap has closed over time between whites and blacks, um, whereas the mortality gap has, uh, has stayed the same. And it sort of lends uh, more um, uh, credence to the fact that, that, that an important area for consideration when we're examining mortality differences between blacks and whites have to do with um, the types of cancers uh, that African American women are likely uh, to be diagnosed with as well as um, the access to and the types of treatments they might receive after diagnosis. And so therefore, uh, within this context, the task force felt it was important to call out these differences in clinical considerations to make um, patients and physicians aware, but not to call out the need for more screening because, um, or different patterns of screening because there both isn't evidence and there, um, what evidence exists is not compelling for suggesting that uh, screening is in fact the gap uh, that, that if improved could, uh, could have an impact on the types of uh, disparities in mortality that are observed. Next slide. So we do um, try to convey um, these complex and important details um, within the body of the recommendation. It's a challenge for us because we know people read the top line recommendation but oftentimes don't venture into the body of the recommendation. But we do spend a lot of time trying to craft the language that exists in clinical considerations. Our goal here is to communicate to patients and to clinicians as well as to researchers in order to describe gaps in evidence that might be research priorities. And an essential one in this case for African American women is uh, conveying uh, the, the, uh, the state of the evidence um, without um, inadvertently conveying that there is a less urgency in African American women to be screened, um, um, but conveying that, 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 that African Americans should be screened um, as as we would make that recommendation for, for any woman in the ages that, uh, for which we were recommending. Next slide. Another way we try to, uh, to uh, provide information that we hope is useful to clinicians and patients uh, that reflects the, the heterogeneity um, in, in both the, 
the patient population, the risk, and the, 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 the disease outcomes of interest. Um, uh, a good example here is in the abnormal blood glucose and type 2 diabetes screening. So this is a B recommendation. The task force recommends screening for abnormal blood glucose as a part of cardiovascular disease cardiovascular risk assessment in adults ages 40 to 70 who are obese or overweight. Clinicians should offer or refer patients with abnormal blood glucose to intensive behavioral counseling interventions to promote a health, helpful diet and physical activity. Now, the challenge in this recommendation when we think of um, ra uh, racial and ethnic subgroups within the U.S. is that um, there is evidence to suggest that the risk um, for diabetes may, uh, may be different, um, uh, but, uh, risk being present at lower levels of BMI and at younger ages. Um, but again, these populations are relatively understudied, and so the task force couldn't convey, couldn't uh, make uh, specific recommendations for these subgroups, but did um, try to convey this in the clinical considerations. The next slide, you'll see how we did this. So in the populations under consideration, of course, it, it, we talk about uh, who, who this population applies to. The second paragraph, though, um, uh, discusses the heterogeneity that, that one might see in practice. So persons who have a family history of diabetes, history of gestational diabetes, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, or are members of certain race ethnic groups, African Americans, American Indians, Alaska Natives, Asian Americans, Hispanic American, Latinos, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, may be at increased risk for diabetes at younger ages or at lower body mass index. Clinicians should consider screening earlier in persons with one or more of these characteristics. This statement actually, although it doesn't appear in the top line recommendation, it appears on our website and in all of our communications right under the recommendation. Next slide. We also want to make sure that we highlight this in the research gaps, that the task force only had two studies, both conducted in Europe, um, that both that directly evaluated the mortality benefits of screening. Um, these populations have limitations that we note here, and that uh, we specifically call out that more research is needed on the effects of screening among race ethnic minorities because they have a higher prevalence of diabetes than white persons, um, and uh, we, we need more information both about um, the, the, the incidence at, at lower BMIs as well as the age at which to start screening. Next. So, and then, and then finally, um, it should be clear, as many of you are making guidelines uh, yourself, that that more often than not, we have insufficient evidence to make a recommendation. And when a task, when evidence is lacking, the task force job is to highlight the insufficiency, to summarize the limited available evidence, and to call for more research to fill these gaps. Um, our methods generally preclude us from making recommendations solely based on epidemiological evidence. A questioner asked um, earlier whether we refer to other guidelines and other systematic reviews. Um, what is often the case is that, well, it is always the case that we do refer to other guidelines in our own uh, recommendation statements, and it is, um, and those guidelines um, sometimes have um, more language, more liberty to describe uh, practice patterns that might differ for particular race ethnic subgroups at, at different age groups. And we do refer to those in our recommendation statements because we know that doctors and patients still need to make decisions even in the absence of evidence. But our job is to really call for more research because, um, you know, research in some of these populations that might be at differential risk is, is itself important. Next. So uh, the example here uh, uh, in the breast cancer example is the I recommendation for women 75 and older. This is not a recommendation against screening these women. It's a call for more research. Um, and so our language here is meant to convey uh, that doctors and patients must make decisions together uh, to determine the appropriate age to stop screening uh, for a given woman, uh, but that there also needs to be more research in older women. Next. <clears throat> 
How do we communicate? Um, it should be clearer, and you all know these are complex issues, um, and, uh, and uh, we pay a, a lot of attention to them throughout our process, but communicating uh, this complexity to all of the subgroups and the, all of the populations uh, and all of the communities uh, in the U.S. who might uh, benefit from understanding this heterogeneity is itself um, is itself challenging. And so we have uh, we have endeavored to to try to communicate directly with our stakeholders and done more with uh, the advocacy groups um, uh, that might rec represent a specific diverse group. So these are pictures of me uh, talking to um, a, a, a prostate cancer advocacy group that uh, is interested specifically in African Americans and prostate cancer. This is on Capitol Hill at a disparities uh, summit that that group, uh, FEN, held. I, I think we found that one advantage of uh, engaging directly with some of these groups is that um, is that uh, they are engaged both um, in providing us comments throughout our recommendation process. It also helps them to engage when they're when they're engaged in advocacy in um, in uh, directing their attentions uh, to sometimes the the more appropriate uh, targets for their attention. Sometimes uh, it leads them to call for more research to uh, to the NIH directly or to other other groups directly uh, to call for diverse participation in research. Or if it's about um, issues related to to coverage or access, uh, to point to the language within our recommendations statements that is directed to their particular population. And so that's what we feel the value of engaging directly with stakeholders is. Congress is also our stakeholder, and so we, we um, this is me testifying and um, highlighting uh, um, our approach to uh, the diversity of populations in the U.S. Uh, to Congress. Next slide. And we do a, a report to Congress every year, and one thing that we do is to highlight the evidence gaps, and many of these evidence gaps relate to specific segments of the U.S. population for which we would like to make recommendations based on the burden of disease, but unfortunately have no evidence, uh, and, um, and highlighting this in order to hopefully affect uh, the research agenda. Next slide. So I think what we've just tried to uh, convey to you today is that uh, making recommendations to address the diversity of the population served in clinical practice in the U.S. is critically important. It's important for the task force in order to achieve our goal of improving the health of all Americans. Uh, to do this uh, requires a focused attention to our methods, the evidence review and synthesis, and you've, uh, this, is, uh, this has been a really a terrific partnership with the Evidence-Based Practice Centers, and you've heard uh, uh, from Jennifer and her colleagues, and I urge you to look at the, the work that they've published in this area because it's, it's very, uh, it, I think it's, it's very much uh, sort of pushing uh, us uh, to clarify our methods in really important ways. When the task force receives the evidence to make recommendations, um, th th this process is in fact com complex. We believe we need to be guided by our existing protocols, uh, but we also, also have to be informed by our stakeholders, our end users, the people who these, uh, these guidelines are designed uh, to help in clinical practice. And we are continuing to refine our process in order to make sure that they really address uh, the needs of uh, the diverse uh, communities uh, 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 for whom they are intended. So I have, I'm sure we're happy to take questions at this point. Thank you, Dr. Bibbins Domingo and Dr. Lynn. Please put your questions into the chat box and send them to the Rock Creek host, please. I do have some questions already. Um, this is for both Dr. Bibbins Domingo and Dr. Lynn. Uh, do you have a pro process to extrapolate information from adult studies to translate into guidance for pediatric care in the case where pediatric studies are not available? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. Well, I don't know, Jennifer, do you, do you want us to start? Oh, you should feel free to start. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, um, so, so part of our portfolio includes recommendations for pediatric practice, and there we would look for studies in the pediatric populations. 
Um, the procedures for extrapolating from adult studies into pediatrics is one that, that is not one that we would engage in. We're really going to start with the studies in pediatrics. Where we would and where we are often faced with the interest in and desire to extrapolate is, um, is in areas where the, the outcomes, the pediatric outcomes of interest might be um, might uh, be ones that extend into adulthood, and so we're trying to look for patterns like for let's say the cardiometabolic risk, like a lipids or um, or uh, elevations in blood pressure. We're trying to look into uh, outcomes in, in adulthood, and for for those we are um, we are often essentially extrapolating from literature that helps us to understand um, the intermediate outcomes that might be important. Um, we're not waiting for the child with high blood pressure to actually have a heart attack. We might be looking at intermediate outcomes, and sometimes that data from intermediate outcomes comes from adults. Um, but in general, it, a recommendation for um, a preventive service in children, the primary literature that we are starting from is literature in childhood. And if any extrapolation is happening, it's it's when we already have a base of literature in, in, in the childhood population uh, to, to help us um, to, to try to fill some of those gaps. So, Jennifer, I don't know if you have something to add. Yeah, no, I completely agree, um, Kirsten, with your, uh, with your answer. I, you know, obviously age um, exists on a continuum, and there are, I can think of at least one example um, for uh, screening for, uh, I'm sorry, not counseling for skin cancer counseling in which, um, you know, we did try to parse out the evidence clearly from children, you know, um, adolescents, young adults and adults. And again, since age exists on this continuum, um, you know, a lot of times it might be difficult to, um, uh, to determine when um, studies conducted in, um, you know, college-aged individuals, is that, you know, more young adults or is that adolescents or is that a little bit of both? So I think how you, where, how you interpret the evidence um, needs to take into account, take into the larger context and also sort of the biologic plausibility. Are there really differences at different ages? But by and large, the task force does parse out the, the pediatric and adolescent topics separate from the adult topics, and that said, separate from the pregnant women topics as well. Thank you very much. There's another question. I'll put up a slide that might help. Um, can you give, Dr. Bivens-Domingo, can you give a high-level description of the definitions of magnitude of net benefits? Um, a high-level description. <laughs> um, well, um, let, 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 let me just start by saying that, um, that uh, I, I want to make sure I'm addressing your, your question. So, um, so magnitude of net benefit in general is the idea that um, that if we could mentally take benefits of uh, and subtract harms, um, that one would get a net benefit, right? In reality, we know that um, that the benefits of a preventive service and the harms of a preventive service are measured on different scales and are are of different types. So, with mammography screening, it's benefits in terms of reductions in breast cancer mortality, and the harms relate to um, uh, some to overdiagnosis and potential overtreatment, as well as um, false positives and anxiety around those false positives. Um, those are two different types of of um, obviously of of, uh, of things to assess, um, but um, but uh, but for example, across the cancer screening topics, um, we know that false positives and overdiagnoses are are common types of harms that we're that we're assessing, and especially when overdiagnosis leads to overtreatment, are much more tangible harms that have um, sort of concrete potentially health outcomes related to them. Um, but it is a judgment call when it comes to, to understanding this. The task force is um, works, uh, has been engaged over time in trying to understand how our magnitude um, occurs, uh, whether our standards for magnitude of net benefit, whether they are 
consistent across topics, and a lot of what the task force is doing is to uh, uh, really, um, to, to really, uh, within the, the, the challenges of assessing benefits and harms, trying to un make sure that we're consistent across topics and how we assign a magnitude of net benefit. Within a topic, and you're looking at heterogeneity, um, where we cut the line between moderate and small, I would say is also um, uh, requires judgment call. And, and some of this is just um, our experience with the topic over time, and sometimes it's driven uh, by where uh, the, the, the evidence uh, tells us is a natural cut point between the two. And sometimes it is driven by, you know, what are the natural sub, subgroups within uh, the population that we've defined at the outset. Um, uh, so I, I don't know if I'm addressing exactly what, what you're what you're you're getting at. I, I think we have strived for consistency um, across topics and within topics. There is judgment certainly involved, um, but um, but I would say that um, and and then where to make the cut within the subgroups is informed, I think, by the way our analytic framework is is. Um, is developed up front in terms of the populations where we might give an A or a B or a different, different recommendation to. Thank you. Another question for Dr. Vivian Domingo. How does the task force ensure that they get input from diverse populations on their recommendations? And can you speak to the diversity on the task force in the task force membership? Yeah, so um, so let me speak to the diversity of the task force membership um, up front. Um, I would say that this, um, uh, you know, we are still a small group. Um, there's 16 of us, and um, we are we um, ha uh, represent uh, the the primary care specialties across child, uh, adult, older adult. Um, uh, and pregnant women, and so, and then within that, um, we want to make sure that we have some geographic diversity as well as race ethnic diversity. And I think that um, if you look at the task force, um, at least since I've been on the task force, which is all I can speak to, I don't have much more of a historical perspective. I would say we've done a, a fair job um, um, uh, assuring that we have the type of uh, race ethnic diversity, uh, geographic diversity um, within. Uh, within that 16-member uh, panel. I will also note that, uh, and I, I can give you the names of the, of the people that we currently have on the task force, if, if, that's, if that's of interest. Um, I, um, I would say we have an open nomination process for our task force members, and, um, and I would urge you, we, we always, um, we can only accept people who've been nominated. So we we actually, you know, urge people to. We want to make sure we're getting the nominations from a diverse process as possible. So um, how do we do this? I think that. Um, so how do we ensure that that the input that we get is is diverse? I think that um, I will acknowledge it is easier for topics when there is a particular population subgroup um, that we know is 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 of particular interest. So I'll give the example of, of, um, of prostate cancer. We knew that this was a particular, uh, we knew that um, African American men have higher rates of prostate cancer, they have higher rates of mortality, and that the input uh, and making sure our recommendation statement reflected uh, um, uh, input both from uh, uh, researchers and um, and uh, providers who care for uh, for this particular high risk group, as well as um, as well as patients and at patient advocacy groups and other stakeholders in the community uh, for the these high risk groups um, was going to be particularly important. And so uh, so you heard Jennifer talk about making sure that you know we identify the right groups. I think we we then tried to make sure that uh, we we reached out to advocacy groups um, who had particular stake and invited them uh, to actually comment on our on our recommendation statements. Um, I think this is a process that has developed over time, and um, I think I was quite heartened in the prostate cancer example because the groups that did engage actually um, replied back to us and saw that um, we took their comments. Um, to heart, and that we made changes in our research plan in response to the public comments. Um, I think that was, uh, you know, one of our 
that's one in which I know from speaking directly to these groups um, that uh, that um, that the comments were received and that the, the changes made to clarify in response to these comments were appreciated. Now, um, obviously, I only know the ones that I'm talking to, and so um, I think this is a process to, to continue to be out there and ensure that more and more groups are aware of the task force, engaged in the task force, and, and understand their ability to participate. I would say in the rollout of the, of the um, prostate cancer recommendation, um, we did. Uh, uh, we did a. I did a satellite media tour to make sure that we were in the local media stations across the country. I've done Spanish language radio as well as um, uh, uh, radio targeting um, uh, African American populations across the country, um, and um, and I think. I think um, doing these types of things actually extends beyond them. the prostate cancer recommendation for some of this type of outreach. It sort of increases the awareness of all of the types of uh, task force recommendations, and that's exactly what we want. So I would say we're very focused on this. I, I know we can continue to improve, um, and I think the process will uh, of, of engaging in this type of work actually will have benefits for subsequent recommendations, not just the specific one that I'm talking about right now. Thank you. And at the end of the questions, I will share the website for the task force, and so there's lots of information about the methods and also the membership and the process for nominating members and for nominating topics. So I'll share that at the end. Um, this is a question for Dr. Lynn. I'm looking for it. I apologize. Oh, there are several questions about social determinants of health. And in your reviews for the task force, how do you address um, the uh, these social determinants of health? Um, so, yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, treating um, uh, categorization by social determinants of health much like we would approach any subpopulation of interest, so persons with um, lower socioeconomic status, um, persons w with less education than perhaps the general public, um, we would apply those same principles. Um, as evidence reviewers, we, um, I know this is sort of a vague cop-out answer, my apologies, but as evidence reviewers, we are, we are limited by the included studies. Um, we're limited by the evidence that is out there. And um, um, in some bodies of evidence, there are more primary research in um, in populations with more uh, diversity in their social determinants of health, mainly. I'm assuming they're talking a little bit more about sort of the socioeconomic aspects. Um, and in those instances, yes, we do, we do call, we do call um, out those details about the, the populations included in the studies. Um, but in many, in many, in many bodies of research, these people, these um, sort of disadvantaged populations are not well represented, much like different, uh, much more like diversity and sort of race, ethnicity um, is not represented. And so we're left with what we are left with. Um, but I will say we don't treat social determinants any differently than we would any other risk categorization or subpopulation categorization. And can, can I also just say that, um, that you know here here um, because my research is in relates to social determinants of health and so when we think about what puts groups at risk for the particular outcomes certainly we, uh, social, the social determinants are are critically important but our charge here is to also is to understand the effectiveness of a clinical preventive service and it's a very in when one considers the entire co uh, construct of social determinants of health, the, uh, the effectiveness of a clinical preventive service is just one lens into what one would do to prevent this particular uh, condition, and that's the one that the task force is charged with. So the, the social determinants, I think, do, you know, as, as Jennifer says, they're, they're part of the, it, it's another variable that, that one considers is the way we look at the population. I think when the task force then takes up the the, the evidence report. Our job is to consider in the diversity of 
specific types of practices where people um, might be receiving these preventive services in the types of communities um, that, that are at particular risk because of these other uh, uh, social determinants. Uh, to communicate those in clinical considerations so that a clinician and a, and a patient may see, um, see both risk and the, uh, the ability of uh, this preventive service to modify that risk in the context that, that makes sense uh, for that particular uh, person in that particular community. But I think, I think it's often challenging because risk is, uh, be because our focus is still just on the clinical preventive service as the means to modify that risk. So the ability of other factors to modify that risk is, is something that, um, that, that sort of still sits in the background but has to be discussed in the clinical considerations. Thank you. I have one last question, um, and this is for, for Dr. Bivens Domingo and Dr. Lin, if you'd also like to, to comment. Um, given that there are few um, studies that include enough people of, um, of diversity in RCTs, what other types of evidence do you consider? And if you don't consider other types of evidence, are you considering changing your methods? And someone also asked uh, um, related to this about modeling and its role in uh, making recommendations for diverse populations. Jennifer, do you want to start? I'm happy to yeah, take this. I'll start it with a sort of an easy answer. Um, uh, that's a, you know, I think that's an imp a, a very important and astute observation um, uh, with randomized controlled trials. That said, we don't, it, for many of our key questions, so these are the individual questions that we ask in a systematic review to support a recommendation, we, do, we don't focus solely on randomized controlled trials. Um, and we do often look at well-conducted observational studies. But I will say that a lot of the well-conducted observational studies are also, also have similar limitations and then additional methodologic challenges to their evidence. So I think it is important to, when randomized control trials are limited, not just because of their uh, inability um, to represent a diverse population or um, certain subpopulations, but for many reasons in their limited applicability, it is important to expand the evidence to observational studies. And we have done that, um, and we have done that quite routinely as to support some of the task force recommendations. So, uh, so, so I think this is an important question, and I do think that it is, it is um, probably a misread of our, of our, um, of our procedures to say that we rely, well, it's definitely a misread to say that we rely solely on randomized controlled trials and that uh, because um, diverse populations are not represented in the randomized controlled trials, we could never make the recommendations and, you know, and it's sort of, you know, not reasonable to call for another randomized controlled trial of PSA screening in black men or a randomized controlled trial of, um, you know, cervical cancer screening in, uh, in native women, right? So that, that is, that, that's not going to happen. So it, whatever, that's, that's a, a critique we hear often. The task force has methods to understand, um, to understand a, a chain of evidence when there, a randomized control is, the trial is not available. And for many of the, the recommendation statements we're talking about, uh, the considerations within certainly race ethnically diverse subgroups or even subgroups um, that are at the tails of age uh, that might not be in the randomized control trial, we, have, we do consider other types of evidence to, to understand whether we should uh, make a different recommendation um, by age, by by uh, sex, by race, ethnicity, even if those are not the groups that are specifically represented or are um, called out um, by the highest evidentiary standards in the randomized control trial. And I would say that when we do have um, a, a recommendation that's built on the highest standards in the randomized control trials, understanding variation within these subgroups is one where we would consider other types of evidence, and that would be observational evidence. And we, we are um, and we have considered modeling studies. Um, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, one has pointed out that modeling studies are, in fact, the way in which we, um, we extended the age, uh, the age 
subgroup uh, in some of our in some of our um, some of our cancer recommendations. Um, how we use modeling uh, for race ethnic diverse populations, I think, is um, is one in which we're we're still. Uh, uh, trying to uh, to understand the best methods. This this in fact would be uh, a potentially um, important use of modeling, but we would want to understand how those models actually whether they do um, in fact uh, recapitulate the the um, the the underlying biological differences um, that uh, that might lead to to uh, differences in disease manifestation and then therefore for effectiveness of a preventive service. Um, examples where, um, where um, observational studies or modeling studies might come into play, let's say, would be like colorectal cancer screening, where we have an A recommendation, but we know that African Americans um, appear to have um, a younger age at disease onset and would should the age to start screening uh, be shifted uh, to younger ages. That's one in which where um, we actually looked, but the, the evidence was not sufficient for us to, to make a separate recommendation. We call it out in clinical considerations. But that's one in which um, we're not expecting that there would be new randomized controlled trials. In fact, we would expect that it would be observational studies and potentially modeling studies that would allow us to understand in the future how uh, how those um, how African Americans uh, might uh, whether there's a reason to screen differently in African Americans. We also recognize that in the absence of evidence that meets meets this task force's uh, standards uh, for um, uh, for separate recommendations that clinicians and patients must make decisions. And so that's an example where we have called out the recommendations of, of others in, uh, in, uh, on colorectal cancer screening uh, to help guide uh, the considerations in African Americans in particular. So. Thank you, Dr. Vivian Domingo. I'm sorry that we weren't able to ask all of the questions. Um, but if you're interested in more information about the task force, I'm sorry I didn't put the website up here, but if you Google Preventive Services Task Force, it should come up, but the website is www.uspreventiveservicestaskforce.org. All of the recommendations, the reviews done by the EPCs, um, like Dr. Lin's, are all there. Um, also, if you're interested in methods, click on methods on the left-hand side and the procedure manual and other manuscripts about the task force methods are there. You could also click on the red envelope and get sign up for the listserv and you will get email alerts whenever there's something new posted by the task force. Um, on your screen is the website for GIN, um, Guidelines International Network, where the slides and recording will be available. I just want to uh, put a quick uh, mention of the EGAP 3 meeting. Um, this is the third meeting. It's a meeting that is sponsored by both the Guideline International Network North America community as well as the evidence-based healthcare section from the New York Academy of Medicine. The um, video recordings and proceedings are available on that website. I'll pause it there for you so you can jot that down. I apologize. I um, it's not an easy website to remember. If you attended and you're interested in giving some feedback, please feel free to email um, ebmny at nyam.org. Um, the evaluation is still ongoing on that meeting. It was held in March. Uh, next month in June, the um, GIN North America webinar will be on guideline developments for and by non-physician clinicians, so stay tuned uh, for more information. If you're not a member of the um, GIN North America and you want to get information about webinars, future webinars, or, or being, becoming a member, um, please go to the g dot, I'm sorry, g-i-n.net website and click on Communities. And North America, and there's information about getting on the lister for the GIN North America web, uh, webinars. So I want to thank Dr. Bivens Domingo, Dr. Lynn, and Dr. Eater for joining us today and, and sharing their work related to um, diverse populations and uh, evidence-based guidelines. Thank you.